la, 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 la. All right. Pretty well, I, I think that uh, I think that busted the mic, so we're good you to go. You want me to sing more? No, I want you to sing less or none. Figaro, fi- Can we just do an hour of me singing? <laughs> no, absolutely I, I feel, not. I feel. I feel like that's what our listeners truly want, is just my angelic sounding voice. Yeah, um, I, I don't think that's, I don't, don't think, think that's so? the case. I okay. think that there, if we did that, we would get tens of thousands of emails from our listeners saying So, no. okay, so you're telling me we would get more listeners and more, like, rejection letters yeah. than we currently have acceptance letters and viewers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's so it sounds like a sh- yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's I mean, change course. <laughs> Tom, sorry, the, uh, the the topic is changing this week. Um, <laughs> oh, god damn it. I love these guys. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am your host, Johnny Blackburn. Alongside me this week are my co-hosts. Gary Elmore. Neil Riley. And this week we are super, super, super privileged and honored to have with us a lifetime improvisational uh, comedian and sketch comic actor, the one and only Tom Booker. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. Perfect. So uh, before we get into uh, introducing Tom and uh, this week's topic, I just I have to know it's been a while. Um, and it's also been a, an inter- entertaining week, interesting week. Uh, what the hell has everybody been doing? We haven't right. really talked about what everyone's been doing over the last month or two during during a quarantine. Anybody got any interesting stories? Are we all just a bunch of lazy slobs that just lay around our houses and binge watch with, Netflix? With and a eat? good steady job. With a good, yeah. I yeah, that's, I, that's I miss from guys and dolls. Ah, <sighs> yeah. When a lazy slob takes a good, good steady, steady job, job, and he smells from Vitalis and Barbasol. Oh, Gary, I love your voice. Th- thank you, thank you, thank fuck you very God, much. I appreciate fuck you that, so Neil. much. Fuck you three times and, over. In and fact, once Johnny, again, I believe we, we, I think we did a cabaret with this song in it or a talent show, uh, didn't we? How can you not remember? Because uh, th- that was in high school. That was uh, how long uh, ago? Seventeen years ago at this point. Eighteen oh, years ago oh, at this point. God. Yeah, you didn't think I was going to be honest about no, the amount of time that it had been, did you? <clears throat> no. Okay, so hmm. what has everybody been doing? Any, uh, any, any, anything new at all? I've, I've, I've literally been doing nothing. We've been writing. We've, we've been writing a script. We've been uh, writing a script. A super secret script. Lead Feather Productions, which brings you, which uh, brings you this uh, wonderful and delectable podcast every single week. Provoking, really. But yeah, really, yeah. it really it is. Yeah. Um, so you're, it's you're not exciting. a smart person if you don't listen to this podcast. No. There's only like eight smart people in the world, so uh, that's cool. Uh, I, eight, that's, that's that, that, that is that is being very generous. Eight. Yes, yes. I think it's it's us and somebody that guest stars uh, an Ian Webb of of uh, movies so bad they're good. Midnight Cult Classics and Camp. Shout out, buddy. Um, God, yeah, I guess yeah. We've been working on uh, on the screenplay there um, for our TV pilot, and God knows how well that's going. Yeah, actually, pretty well. Yeah, it's Honestly, it's we, moving along. We've, we've uh, written a lot more than we thought we were going to. Enclaved ourselves the last uh, two days to <laughs> try and kind of write it. It's been it's been exciting. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like uh, sounds like we've been doing a ton. Uh, anyways, on to less boring stuff. Uh, Tom, how about you? How's how's quarantine been treating you? Anything uh, you've been doing? Anything to to keep your mind sane? Actually, yeah. Quarantine is uh, it's I, it, it it agrees with me. Um, uh, I have been. Uh, uh, teaching some classes online. Also, I, I took a class at Sundance CoLab, and that's got me oh. working on a script too. And that was fun. And in fact, my advisor was one of the uh, original writers on SCTV, which fits in with uh, today's. Really? Yeah, it was it was it was really neat. And uh, and then and then I've really doubled down on my accordion plan because uh, chicks dig the accordion and. Nice. Uh, Oh, yeah, I've been I've been doing a lot. I like I'm taking lessons with a, a class in Chicago, accordion lessons. I, mm-hmm. I did, <laughs> did, did a virtual sketch show with the Annoyance Theater in Chicago. So I have been uh, been busy. Yeah, Tom. Well, I I, I want to let you know that I also play the penny whistle. So maybe we could get together and make a band. Wow. Yeah, we should just do like yeah. Hall and Oates hits. Or yes, like, exactly. Because <laughs> there's nothing millennial chicks love more than Hall and Oates hits. Yes, the yeah. yeah. accordion and the penny whistle. Yeah, yeah, heard it here. Uh, I don't, I don't play any instrument, so I guess I'm. I'm you you I'm play out. the voice. I do. Yes. I, I could sing. Uh, and sing. Neil, 
Neil plays the spoons. Oh my I god, plays plays spoons. Spoons. <laughs> it's like heaven when he plays the spoons. <laughs> this sounds like the worst band <laughs> in fucking history. Uh, no, Flash forward a year from now when we're <laughs> opening, opening at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> when we're playing the Super Bowl halftime show <laughs> and disgracing J Lo. Um, <laughs> Johnny, you can dress like J Lo. I'm not gonna do that. I could not wear. I, I could not wear that that outfit as well as she did. That is that is for damn sure. Uh, <laughs> all right, moving right along into uh, the topic for this week. Uh, this week we wanted to go on ahead and uh, get into. Uh, actually, um, com- a few comments that we had gotten from other people. You guys were looking for us to get into uh, comedic films a little bit more and dissecting the process behind the script writing for that. And we thought the SNL segue would be a really a great transition into that. So today we're going to be discussing uh, primarily SNL alumni and their success and failure uh, after the show. Uh, we'll also kind of be discussing uh, SNL as a launching pad for the careers of uh Probably, I'd say that almost the majority of everybody that that comes on there, mm-hmm. uh, and then we'll also be diving into the world of sketch comedy and improvisational comedy, and uh, the three main schools of thought and troops that contribute to the uh, the making of the SNL cast. That being uh, up, uh, Upgrade, Citizens Brigade, Second City Theater, and uh, the Groundlings. And so, uh, luckily, we were able to come across Mr. Tom Booker. Uh, Tom has lots of experience, especially um, with Second City, to my knowledge. Uh, Tom, let's. Oh, I do want to take a little bit and introduce you to uh, to our audience and listeners today. Um, so, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about where you started, uh, how you got into sketch comedy, um, kind of who you've worked with, what projects you've done over the last so many decades, uh, okay. and so forth. All right. Um, I'm from Oklahoma originally, and I, I was the. State, I was the mascot for the basketball team from 1984 to 1986. Really? What uh, university? Yeah. At, at OU or at OU, State? Yeah. Or? Okay. University of Oklahoma. I was a I was a dog, a top dog. Wow. And, okay. And I, right. and I liked liked people looking at me. And I had a roommate from Chicago, and he told me about this place called Second City. So after I thought I graduated, I uh, <laughs> was three hours short. Um, I, uh, oh, man. I moved to Chicago. Yeah, my dad's still mad. I uh, <laughs> moved to Chicago to study in Second City. And I, I got there at a great time. I got there uh, in the fall of 86, and I studied That's at a place time. called Bears Workshop of Second City. I studied uh-huh. the Second City Conservatory. Um, I also helped start a theater called the Annoyance Theater that's still going strong, which UCB came out of. Oh. Um, and, I, and I studied at I, IO or Improv Olympic, as we called it then, yeah. a member of a house team. And uh, Del Close was one of my teachers. I was lucky enough to, uh, to study with Del. And when I was in Chicago in the 80s, um, Chris Farley was in my class. I put John Favreau in his first play. Um, oh, yeah. Steve Carell, cool. Steve Colbert. Um, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler. Um, it was just, it was, a, like I said, a great time to be there. And then I was in a show, one of the shows I was in at the uh, Annoyance Theater um, took off, and uh, it was called The Real Life Brady Bunch. And it was directed by Bill Soloway and her sister Faith, and uh, and we ended up taking that to Off-Broadway. So I was playing Bobby Brady Off-Broadway for a year, and, <laughs> and we went to went to LA and, uh, um, I, uh, was Bobby Brady again for a year out in LA and it was the, uh, called it the pet rock of, um, nineties theater. Cause everybody came, it was really weird. <laughs> and, uh, when the show went on tour, I stayed in LA to get my pilot and I didn't get a pilot, but I got sober. Uh, and, hey, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then on, I'm, I'm, uh, Stayed in, I was in L.A. until about 2007. And I huh. mainly did uh, um, commercials. I made my living doing commercials. I've done about 80 commercials in my career. Entire career is 40 minutes long. And uh, <laughs> um, I continued to do late night bad taste theater. At the Annoyance Theater, we did co-ed prison sluts, the musical, that darned antichrist, and my first show called Manson the Musical. And then in L.A., I had a group of people, inc- including Laura Hall, who was the uh, who's the musical director for Who's Line? Used to be my piano teacher in Chicago, mm. and we started. We wrote musicals together: Patty, Patty, Bang, Bang, the Patty Hearst musical, Up with Puberty, beautiful musical about the ugliest time of your life, and we did a, a show called uh, a stage version of a movie called Valley of the Dolls. We ended up taking that off Broadway. 
and I'm almost done. I swear to God. And then when no, take your time, uh, no, please. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm old. Uh, and then when we came back from New York, my the guy I was putting up theater with said, "We've proven we can break even at theater. Let's do a movie." But we started meeting every day and writing a, a script, thinking we were going to do it. This will date me. We were going to do it clerk style, mm. and uh, yeah, he had he had he had he had access to money, and uh, so we wrote this uh, this film called Kill the Man about a copy shop called long shot copies and a king co's copy opens up across the street and they know they're going to go down but they want to go down fighting and it turned out that uh he's, we sent the script to people that we trusted once we were finished to get their opinion and one of the uh people we sent it to was a guy that he was in the acapella uh, group in college with who was now working at summit entertainment and so Summit Entertainment ended up putting up the money, went on to do Twilight, but we were the first film, but you're welcome for Twilight. Thank and you. Thank uh, you so much. we ended up, doing, it was called Kill the Man and had Luke Wilson and Josh Molina and Terry Garr and Michael McKean. And uh, oh. we ended up going to uh, premiere at Sundance Film Festival in 1999. Mm -hmm. And that's the only feature I've made. So I can say that every feature I've made has been premiered at Sundance. And that's not bad. 100% success rate. That's pretty good. I know, there you go. Uh, films. And uh, 2001, I started teaching at the Second City Training Center in Los Angeles. Uh, mm -hmm. And I taught there until 2007. And then I moved out to Austin, Texas, opened my own improv school and theater. And I did that until very recently. Okay, okay well. well I to, Tom, to, to, I have to ask one thing yes. real quick. Sorry to interrupt, Gary. That's Tom, good. were you in a little show called The Good Guys? Oh, I was. Uh, the Good Guys on uh, with uh, Edley Whitford yeah. and, uh, and, and Colin, uh, Hanks. Kate, Colin Hanks. Yeah, I played a, a, I was a, a, a accountant, I think, that was uh, had some shady deals or something. I was just there for a day. Yeah, I was in The Good Guys. I think my biggest credit... The, and my biggest role was in 1993. I was in an episode during the first season of Babylon 5. <laughs> I, played a, I, played, I played a character named Jinxo who, uh, uh, and who runs across this other guy who they're looking for the Holy Grail because they couldn't find it in Earth, so they uh -huh. thought it would be in space. And I get banned from uh, the space station, Babylon 5, I couldn't leave because when I left Babylon's one through four, they all imploded. So I was, that's where I got the name Jinxo. And, but yes. then in the, in the end, I go off looking for the gray. Mm, okay. Well, I, I, I have three comments on everything you just said. First off, I wow, think, that's a lot of yeah, I know. That's more than you usually have to say. I know. Uh, the Good Guys is one of my favorite series. Uh, it was only it was one. It was only, yeah, it was only one season, but I really liked it. I'm sorry it was canceled, but I do Bradley, remember that episode. Bradley Whitford and, and Colin Hanks, both uh, such a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bradley Whitford went to college with Chris Farley and another guy named Pat Finn that uh, he and Oh, he, went went to, to, he went to Marquette. Okay, I didn't know he went that. to Marquette. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. so he we knew a lot of the same people, and uh, it was so nice and so funny. Mm -hmm. and, and then um, I just wanted to kind of go back to the Patty Patty Bang Bang for the Patty Hearst uh, story. Um, mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know, Patty Hearst um, uh, was. Uh, a, a rich mogul's daughter who got kind of brainwashed and then uh didn't she go in and like she sh like helped like well, she, uh, yeah, yeah. she uh, was part of a bank robbery and then at one point uh, a couple of them uh, a couple of the members of the sla or symbionese liberation army were about to be apprehended by the police and she jumped out of the car and shot a machine mm. gun yeah, and there's that famous picture of her. So that's a really clever title. I just I just wanted to put that out there. Well, thank you. Nobody, nobody told you that before. It was in, it, that one was, I used to like, I liked to do the gimmicks. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with William Castle and uh, the, the king of the gimmick. And he did things like in the Tingler mm -hmm. where he put buzzers on seats and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. when, when, when we did Dance in the Musical the first time at the Annoyance Theater, it was $6 to get in, 5 if you had an X on your forehead. And so uh, the <laughs> audience would just have X's on the foreheads, and we gave out little hits of acid. And so the audience, and then we'd sing an acid trip song, and the audience would take their acid, percent an acid trip. <laughs> and the acid were those, just those, those tiny chiclets. We would announce before the show that there were all placebos except for one. That person was really going to enjoy the show. 
<laughs> and uh, and then for Patty Patty Bang Bang, was in loss of sense around. Uh, so I handed out blindfolds that I made myself. And at a certain point, because she was she was blindfolded, Patty was blindfolded mm-hmm. for the first month, and they would kind of yell insults and Marxist rhetoric at her. And so at one point, uh, you have the audience put on blindfolds, and then the audience comes out, the, the cast comes into the house and would, would uh, insult the audience, and then we'll go back to the show. Wow, that that, that is that is creative. fantastic. I, I mean, what's stopping you guys from doing that today? Oh, COVID. <laughs> yeah, COVID, I guess. There are, Among there, other things, there are a lot of shows that I did in the '80s and '90s that I can't do today. Yeah, I, I can imagine so. I can't imagine so. Um, well, I it's it. I'm glad to hear that it sounds like you were able to carve out a very nice and successful career, not being typecast mm. as as uh, Bobby Brady. Yeah. So. Yeah. So oh, I'm happy for you. Thank and you. I think you're our first guest that has their own uh, Wikipedia page, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't. N- B- BJ and his dad share uh, share one. Okay. But uh, only, only first person to have their own singular yes, one. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know how that happened. I guess that there's just some. I, there's some, I mean, some if I didn't do it, I don't know. I don't know who would. Yes. I, I hey, hey, you should be. You should feel honored. You have a stalker out there somewhere. Yeah. I guess. At least <laughs> <Lucky> me. <laughs> hey, you know what? You'll never be alone again, no matter yeah. what happens. All right. So. <laughs> uh, it's like that movie Misery. <laughs> let's, let's I don't not, like the let, ending. Let's not scare our listeners off this early in the okay, episode. Right. Uh, let's, I'm, let's I'm, I'm sure you'll be fine, Tom. <laughs> well, let's hear some accordion. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Gary, whip that penny whistle up. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess so. We, we kind of wanted to. We kind of wanted to start at the beginning. Um, kind of just yeah. So for you when you were when you were younger, what what was the reason for you wanting to jump into being what 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 made you decide to do you know improv improvisational comedy and sketch comedy as opposed to going and doing stand-up or like getting in and being just a straight up like a comedic actor like what is the mindset of like yourself and other young performers that typically go that route or want to go that route um what's what's the driving force a lot of times i think um well at least at the time i I think of my age as far as has has, as far as stand-up goes Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, when I was starting out, a st- stand-up just, just seemed to be a bunch of angry white guys, and uh, I, I okay. didn't really want to hang out with them. And then it, with improv, I like to say that improv is a art form that attracts funny, lazy people, and uh, for people that want to be writers but don't want to be bothered with that that writing thing. You just kind of show up and do it. Um, I loved making people laugh. I did. I wanted to get on Saturday Night Live, and mm-hmm. um, and uh, I knew that these people went to Second City, and so that's um, that's what I wanted. To, uh, when I well thought I was graduating, job to get with my degree, which was radio, TV, and film or telecommunications from University of Oklahoma, right. was to uh, be working a camera during the news. Go at a affiliate radio station or TV station in Oklahoma City, and that paid minimum wage, which was three thirty-five an hour back in nineteen eighty-six. And I thought I can make minimum wage anywhere, and so that's why I decided to to do it. And I mean, to to that, that I didn't need to use my degree, and uh, it's like it's it, it's fun to make people laugh, and it's fun to work with people create projects and something new and something exciting and that's what was going on and especially in chicago i think i was there at a really good time in that there was nobody yeah. watching you know, it wasn't like la or new york new york you're always working to pay rent in la you're always working to try and and get ahead where chicago nobody was watching us so we got we had room to fail and so when you have room to fail that's when you have room to take risks when you take risks, that's come up when you come up with some great stuff. And it was, uh, I, I think that's why it was such a hot bed, especially during that time. Right. Mm-hmm. So especially with, so it sounds like, did you, it sounds like, yeah, a lot of people, uh, even outside of yourself, a lot of them get into like, they'll go to, uh, they'll go to the groundlings or second city or mm-hmm. improv Olympic or, or anything like that, uh, with the mindset that, Hey, SNL is the end goal. Um, and I, I guess, 
with the people that you met along the way, because I think you said you took classes with, you said you met like Chris Farley and Steve Carell and Tina Fey uh-huh. uh, and people like that. Did you did you get to meet them like not necessarily on like a close personal level, but did you get to have conversations with them and maybe ever go out for a beer with somebody or something yeah. and like they explain to you why they were like why I'm doing this, why why I love it so much, anything along those lines? No, I I, I don't. I mean, yes, I went out and had a lot of beer with a lot of people, <laughs> uh, uh, but we didn't really talk about why we we okay. were we were too busy talking about what we wanted to do. Uh-huh. You know, and and the and what's weird is the ones that were very successful uh-huh. um, are the ones that were doing it for basically for the love of the game and just mm-hmm. wanted to do the best job that they could. Really? You know, they, yeah. And I, one of the, the I think the best at it was Mike Myers. Uh-huh. I remember when Mike Myers moved down from Toronto to Chicago because yeah. he started and, in, Impro- in Improv Olympic. Is that correct? Uh, he well, he started. At, uh, if I if I have this right, he started at Second City in Toronto. In Toronto, okay. Mm-hmm. And then he came down to. Uh, he wanted to study with Del Close, who was directing and and teaching. He was teaching at the Improv Olympic in in Chicago and directing uh-huh. in Chicago. So he came down to uh, Chicago, and he also taught at Improv Olympic. And uh, he was uh, really he treated his art like a small business he wasn't cutthroat but he kind of it wasn't cutthroat at all but he took a look at all right this is what i need to do this is what i see gets people in snl so this is what i need to do how do i do that well and uh you know and he just kind of focused he focused on that and and i i uh one of the things when we were um we were casting people for a movie back in 1999 Notice that uh, people go to we had, we had people that were from New York, Chicago, and LA, and people go right. to New York to study the craft of acting. They don't want to be famous. If that happens, it's a byproduct. They just want to work on becoming the best actor that they can be. Oh, people yeah. would go to Chicago to study comedy, to make people laugh. Um, and again, if they get famous, that's that's great. But we just want to make people laugh. And then people would go to LA to be a star. Mm-hmm. that's that's what they wanted right so yeah wow it, so it's it seems like with a lot of those with a lot of those folks so from what you're saying the people that actually made it were the ones who were not necessarily trying to make it and the ones mm-hmm. who didn't make it they were really like their end goal was fame and fortune kind of thing i think what it comes from uh and there's a great quote by uh from steve martin that said be so good they can't ignore you and um, I think and this and I, I think this is what I suffered from as well uh, that I suffered from is uh, when you're when you're trying, when you're just look, looking to do a good job, do the best job that you can be. You're bringing yourself to it. When you're trying to see what it is when you're just trying to get ahead to be famous. You're not being true. Makes sense. You're trying to do uh, most likely you're trying to do something yeah. they've already seen other than just be yourself and bring yourself to it. Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's, it's untrue, it's inauthentic, and, and they've already seen it. And, uh, but it's when you're, when you're um, you know, on a path of discovery and just trying to do the best job that you can, you know, just staying in the moment, which is ironic, that's what uh, improv is all about. But, you know, just being in the moment and just, constantly working on becoming the best artist that you can be. Uh, right. Those are the people that I think have been successful. So out of all, so out of all the years that you had worked with, with just, you know, the, the, the multitude of different types of people, both, you know, success level and not, um, what was, what was the mentality as far as was there, was there any type of camaraderie in when you got to that second level? Was was it mostly was was it cutthroat? Was it you know was it one for all, all for one, or was it hey I'm in this by myself, stay off my back? No, oh, it was. I, I well, one of the things, the great things about uh, going and studying at Chicago, and one of the things that Second City uh, was really good at was your job is to make the other person look good. If they're making you look okay. good. And it works, and and so that was something that would also be carried on off stage, like, um, g- because I was in Chicago, and then when I moved to L.A. and I was in L.A. for sixteen years. I still had this large family because we were all in Chicago together. Even people that came 
from Chicago after me, and we all looked out for each other, uh, which I think was I was very lucky to have been a part of that. Um, the weird thing is, especially at Second City, um, Second City, there were many levels. It would start, you were in a touring company, and then it would okay. move from the touring company to, then they had a, they called it Second City Northwest. They had a stage out in Schaumburg. And then they also had a, uh, two stages in downtown Chicago. One was Second City ETC. And the other was Second City Main Stage. The mm -hmm. thing is, the people in the touring company want to be at Northwest. People in Northwest want to be in ETC. ETC, they want to be on Main Stage. Main Stage, they want to be in SNL. So I had a director once tell me that it's really hard because everybody's not where they want to be. So that mm -hmm. can be frustrating. Uh, but there wasn't anybody stepping on anyone's laughs or um, fighting not okay. to make the other person look good. Okay, so so that's good. It it, it was a it was a professional culture, but at the mm -hmm. same time, you still had that the sense of of uh, family and camaraderie and so. Oh yes. So that's no, that's that's good. That's good to hear. I, I had always assumed it was a little more cutthroat because there's only three or four, at least at in you know at the time you were out there in the '80s, and so only three or four sketch comedy troops in the country that seemed to be to get the eye of SNL mm -hmm. or to get the eye of Lorne Michaels. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's happening, but it had, that wasn't my experience. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I, so just a, kind of a side note out of all the years you had spent there, who was the funniest person that you bumped into just in your own personal opinion, who was consistently making you laugh, whether they were, whether they were famous or not, doesn't matter. Um, was there one person in particular that just really stands out that just always, there, always cause you, Mike Myers was always always good to watch on stage. Uh -huh. it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, Farley too. There's a, another a friend of mine who I thought was a great stand up who's still in L.A. A guy named Jimmy Paulson, mm -hmm. uh, one of the funniest guys. Uh, I think I've heard that name. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Paulson. I kind of think there's so many. Carell. Uh, so a guy so named Eddie about... Furman. Yeah. Uh, so, so what about um, like Mike Myers uh, puts him as like one of your top echelon for 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 comedians? I mean, what what do you enjoy about a comedian? Is it the character? Is it the character that they're playing? Is, is it, it the type how, of accents? How fast the they think language? on their feet? All yeah. that kind of stuff. I mean, you know what it is? It's and and Tom Hanks does this when he's on Saturday Night Live. Also, Patrick Stewart. They make everything work because they commit completely to everything. Gonna, you know, even if everybody else is on stage is like, I don't know where this is going. They commit to that and they make everything work because of that commitment. Makes right. sense. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Because one of my favorite parts of watching Saturday Night Live is actually watching it when whenever the skit breaks down and seeing the actors have to kind of power through like they forgot a line or they somebody starts laughing, you know, and I like watching them try and get through that sort of. Uh, everything crashing down because I've I, I I did stage acting as well and I know that feeling of oh my god uh, this isn't working how do I get out of that and I I kind of like to see I, I just like to see pain in other people's lives I guess so <laughs> that makes me happy yeah it's tragedy <laughs> it's kind of neat because then everybody's surprised I mean right. we enter this and the actors think they they you know believe they know what's going to happen and they're going to present it to us but then when there's a surprise. We're all like, okay. Then, especially if you're in the audience, uh, you're all in this together. It's a magic mm -hmm. moment in time. Yeah. So I, I guess there's there's also different types of of um, you know not uh, excuse me sketch comedians and uh, improvisational artists. Is that correct? Like there's someone like from what from what I've gathered and what I've I've read before and just seen personally. You have Chris Farley who is primarily just he's just over the top and he's right. just his big gestures and I'm using my body and I have one I have a particular inflection in my voice and a volume that I always hit and it always makes people laugh. And then you have people who are more character, uh, you know, actors Mike like Mike Myers uh, would be like a Mike Myers yeah, would be a perfect yeah. one. Yeah, exactly. Um, did you notice that? Was there were there different categories of of uh, of of actors out there? For I, did, I didn't notice it, but it was it was because I wasn't very observant. I, I do think mm -hmm. that uh, the, the people that because um, I, I think when you're when you're trying in hindsight, when you're trying to do yeah. something like this. It's best to pay attention to what resonates with the audience. Right. And, and that is, that tells you what the audience wants from 
how they see you For sure. uh, because because it's hard to i think it's hard to think of yourself since you're a human being as a product and um and so you can see where your strengths are and play to your strengths i think that's the one of the things that um i did not do very well uh i was you know um but i think it's uh there were certain people that were just uh, just uh very uh better straight men you know? yeah. uh like, uh colbert is much better straight man but then he would just <laughs> was so smart there'd be a line that came out of no one would think of, but it was perfect. You know it what just I mean? Hit, it, hit, it was on point every single time. Exactly. So I, I guess what also what I was trying to allude to was in, in your training, just since you, you know, you are, you are a coach as well as a performer. Huh? Um, when you guys are teaching, I don't know when you, when you're teaching uh, improv acting one Oh one for beginners, or even when you get to people who are more experienced that are at like second city and groundlings and stuff, what type of training and classes do you do they make you guys go through? Like, are there particular exercises you do? Are there particular units of like of theory that you study, or is it all just let's get in a group and do improv games over and over again until we come up with new characters to use at our show each week? Well, a lot of I think a lot of the training is very repetitive. You'll work on certain muscles and then uh-huh. try try and make it your own. I think the okay. big the big thing is just in the moment trying to get rid of expectation is that we're then and just listening and reacting and also um being committed and consistent and so in the beginning it's just about getting comfortable on stage and uh and then when you get comfortable enough you get comfortable enough to fail that's when magic stuff happens because there is no failure especially when you're creating yeah so there's a lot of uh and it just I, I like to say anyone can improvise it just uh it takes confidence and confidence just takes ex- um and but some people need more experience than others right uh are, are, are a lot of the classes that you guys are a lot of the the exercises that you do in uh the beginning classes or any of the classes really is it i i had always i've actually i haven't i did improv in, in college um yeah. but but past that I, I never really dove into it after that um, so it was it, I always kind of pictured as being a little like whose line is it anyway, where they just, you know, they kind of like names from a hat mm-hmm. and they just like, they create a game based off that. Is that kind of how you introduce people to it or like, are what are there particular uh, games that you guys play or is I would, it? I would start, I would start even before that when there's, there's something that has no, um, um, something that has no predetermined end. Mm-hmm. What I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. where where it's it's all where they just start to get comfortable on stage and and mm-hmm. uh and just listen and and react without thought right. um if i'm making sense here but uh so mm-hmm. i mainly and just i would basically just learn to play and, and play and not worry about uh getting it right like mm-hmm. to say an improv the only way to do it wrong is to try and get it right sure. uh, then you're, you're what's right you're creating something that we've never <laughs> seen before uh one of i uh, my first job in sobriety was every actor's dream job <laughs> i was i was working for steven spielberg i was a waiter oh, wow. i was a waiter at his restaurant nice and uh um I'll take anyway while out. i it was it was, was dive <laughs> it was a submarine sandwich place called dive anyway mm-hmm. um I uh, was about to quit. I, I was going out on a lot of auditions, and um, I wasn't getting anything. I was going to quit. One of my fellow servers gave me this person's number, said, you need to take her workshop. Called her up. Turns out we'd known each other, and she said she, we traded messages on answering machines. It was the 90s. And she said, you know, we just need to have a conversation. And when we talked, she just asked me one thing. She said, are you doing what you think they want, or are you doing what you do? I said, I, I'm doing what I think they want. She said, stop it. Do what you do. And so... Um, and then I just started booking like a fiend because when I was doing what I think they wanted, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. I was giving them something they've already seen. It wasn't being, I wasn't giving them what I had to bring. I wasn't giving them any sort of surprise. And so what I work for as a teacher is to try them, try to get them to be themselves, you know, just be relaxed and, and it, or be themselves playing a character and, yeah. and not worry about laugh. Well, the weird thing is when you don't try and get the laugh, you get the laugh. When you try and get the laugh, 
don't get it because it's not it's untrue and the audience can sense when you're lying to make sense okay yeah, I, I, I could I could easily see that. I mean, just from watching those types of shows over and over again. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's, it's important forced. to be what you're saying is it's important to be authentic when you're giving a performance of uh, of improv because authentic to the moment that you've created. Yes. Yeah, because you're all creating that in real time, both you um, and the audience, because you're reacting off of their energy. Yeah. You're sharing the experience. I think that's a pretty that's pretty good universal knowledge for any yeah. performer in general, whether you're reading from something scripted, whether mm. it's dramatic or anything. You know, I mean, the audience wants to they want to connect to something that they want to perceive, at least for that hour and a half, is is real and genuine. Right. Okay. Uh, it's it's all about uh, art is all about connection, and the, and most of the notes in improv are stop shouting and slow down. Uh, sometimes <laughs> it's just like, why does it have to be so loud? Interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm so used because from, from a lot, especially from the three of us, I mean, now, you know, we're all producing and, and directing and writing at this point, but from where we all started was acting in theater was, mm -hmm. was the big thing. And when you're acting from, you know, a, a Shakespeare or a mammoth script or something like that, your, your critique from your director is very detailed on specific lines. And they're like, watch the cadence of this particular word sequence or watch your, your volume here on this word, because it makes this character do this. And it's very detailed. And so it's just interesting to hear that it's, it's just very improv is just like, no, stop shouting, you know, yeah. quit moving around so fast. Like, yeah, that's because when you don't have so a structure to critique, like you do in a, a, a written script, mm -hmm. There's the critique has to be less structured as well, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it makes, that makes... To listen to the other player. Listen, it's very Meisner, Meisner like. I was just thinking it was very Meisner. Yeah, I was like, oh. Listen and react. Listen and react based on the truth that you've created. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so so moving moving from that there, I, I wanted to get back to uh, the portion of, of of Second City and all that. So the. I th we had met, we had briefly talked about this earlier, but just for our, our listeners, uh, I had asked you if you you had ever gotten the opportunity to uh, audition for SNL, and you said unfortunately you did not. Um, but can you can you kind of from the minor auditions you had heard about and what you had experienced, um, what did you see uh, from where SNL was going uh, in in the in the late '80s? Since you were kind of right there in the middle of it. Oh, uh, um, you mean the audition process, or yeah, 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 the audition process. Uh huh. What I understand, they would they would invite people to audition, and uh, they would have to bring their characters. Okay. And um, so I think they would do like five characters, and and you would um, you would audition for Marcy Klein. You would audition for the casting director, and then if you got passed on to the next level, um, and there would be some time month or so waiting, you would then audition. Or uh, producers, or Michaels and, and others, and and uh, basically it was you doing your characters on the empty stage or on an empty uh -huh. an empty studio. And then if uh, they liked you, you would have lunch with Lauren Michaels and uh, someone else, and then and then uh, uh, because like I said, I had four friends that were in the Miss Vagina pageant that that got uh -huh. cast, and then they. Had they would uh, would be Lauren Michaels and there was someone else I don't know what their position was it could have mm -hmm. been his assistant could have been another an executive producer I, I don't know and then two of the the people that auditioned and they would have lunch and get to know each other and then after lunch they would go for a walk and at a certain point each person would walk alone with Lauren Michaels so he could get a feel for them and I guess see how they would fit into the SNL family. Oh, and then, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then um, they would uh, they would wait, and you really never knew. And I, and I don't think, and I I think part of uh, Orange process is to mulling over for a long time. And uh, there is a lot of waiting, and there are a lot of people on the bubble. And eventually, you get the call, and and you go up to New York. That's right, and the, and dreams come true. Um, dreams come true. It's and so. For for those I, I I suppose for those that either audition and didn't make I just have to say first off that has to be so damn nerve wracking for someone who's used to performing in front of you know twenty twenty uh, classmates or colleagues and then you know fifty people in the audience to out of nowhere you're performing for one or two people mm -hmm. and you know like there's not it doesn't seem like you know it seems like in improv you feed off the audience reaction I mean how 
how drastically different is that to feed off two people's energy as opposed to 50? Um, two I, people who probably aren't laughing. <laughs> probably no. not. They're probably just stoic as fuck and just staring straight at, staring oh, a, a um, hole through your soul. Sometimes you get like a pity laugh in an audition. Just <laughs> <laughs> That would make me feel worse. I'd rather him be silent. <laughs> there was one story. I don't know if you guys know of Terry Sweeney, who was yeah. Uh, yeah, Terry Sweeney. Uh -huh. He told me his story. He, uh, he, um, once he was, uh, he was calling a friend, called a friend up and he uh -huh. said, uh, Hey, let's go out tonight. And the friend said, Oh, I can't, I'm working on my packet for SNL. And so Terry hung up the phone and was like, I'm funnier than that asshole. And so he, <laughs> He said, I brewed a cup of a pot of coffee and he stayed up all night and he wrote sketches. And then he showed up the next day at 30 Rock with a bunch of sandwiches. Now, this was in the 80s back when you could do this sort of thing. And he said, I've got sandwiches for the writers of Saturday Night Live. And they let him up. <laughs> He showed up with sandwiches, and he said, oh, I'm not really a sandwich delivery person, but here's some scripts that I wrote. And he got hired from that. What? See, you got to take the Just initiative, right? There. Put yourself out there. That's right. Yeah. Even, even if even if it's uh, illegal and frowned upon. Just, yeah. you know. Imagine he got, he got hired as a <laughs> as a writer first, but then it made it into the cast. But that that's yeah. how he got on Saturday Night Live. That's 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 nuts. I mean, hey, good on good on him for yeah taking that initiative and, yeah. and going one step further than the competition. Yeah. Yeah. His his friend never got on though. It's don't think so. Deep don't think so. Yeah. It's probably into a deep depression. Yes. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, if he wasn't ready to do some criminal trespass to get on SNL, I mean, <laughs> it was the eighties. It wasn't criminal trespass back then. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. You do where the hell you wanted. Oh. Uh, so, uh, so I guess for the for the folks that don't make it on necessarily, or or don't necessarily get an audition um, after after they've done a couple of years of, because you said you do working for Second City or UCB or whatever, you said you could make about minimum wage doing that, or oh, how's uh, the living? It depends. I mean, it depends if you get paid as a teacher. It's it's hard to make a, uh -huh. a full time living doing that unless you do gotcha. things like like commercials. Okay. Uh, okay. Because most. Uh, uh, if you're on stage at Second City, you do make a living wage. They are an equity theater, and they do pay a living wage uh -huh. um, in Chicago. They do not have a stage on in L.A. for the for the reason that it, they can't support the actors on on uh, to perform in L.A. and they don't right. see, they don't think it's fair to pay actors in Chicago and not pay the actors in L.A. for doing the same show. Right. Um, so uh, Second City is is very good about that. Downlands, as far as I, if I and I could be wrong because it's been a while, but I think you got uh, the uh, L.A. had a has a thing called uh, 99 seat waiver where they're supposed to give cast um, five dollars for performance for gas. Um, usually they don't. Groundlings may and it, it may have changed, um, but it does help to be in a Groundlings show and um, have it on your resume. And also there's a lot of both places there is and even UCB. It's just a lot of networking that you you know you work with people and people hire their friends like i remember when will farrell uh was at the groundlings and he and two uh, two of his uh, fellow um former students or stu people that were students with him a guy named mike collins and uh another guy named scott wanio at the uh did a, a show called simpatico which was his number one performance art troupe and uh and after Will got on Saturday Night Live, he was able to get the other two guys on as writers. So, oh, yeah. So they and um, everybody does help out everybody if they can. Paste a network, absolutely. What? So for the people that don't make it on, what did you kind of notice their their careers? Like, what trajectory did it? What direction did it take them in? Where did they go exactly? I know with you, you said you did. Uh, you ended up teaching a bunch. You opened your own improv theater. You did commercials. Do a lot of people. Be, end up becoming actors do they go back do they do start doing stand-up um kind of what's the what's the main norm no it, it, it depends i don't think there's any one clear-cut uh way it's uh some people that is enough and uh they want they're t they're tired of struggling uh -huh. i reached a point in my 30s i was like, like oh i guess i'm an actor and i never really knew what else to do uh -huh. um uh but uh you know some people uh it's it, there's, I, there's really no, you, you find your way. I mean, some sure, people yeah. don't, don't get on Saturday Night Live and then become very successful actors or very successful writers or, or directors. 
That's that's true. Uh, I mean, yeah, we uh, actually had done some. Uh, Neil, who was who was part of that list that we were researching for people that are super famous stars that uh, didn't make the cut for SNL? I mean, just uh, off the top, big names were like Jim Carrey, uh, Steve Carell, Donald Glover got passed over, um, Zach yeah, Galifianakis. I, I, very funny, funny people like David Cross didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, so what, uh, Tom? What uh, do you think? is considered success with 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 most people that kind of go into the uh the improv circuit i mean what 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 would they normally say like yes okay i have i i feel successful now what's the pinnacle kind of thing yeah what 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 sort of is that measure what's weird is uh, uh it's weird because i think your your definition of success changes over time Mm -hmm. um in la i've discovered longer I'm, i live in austin texas now but when i lived in la I realized that the longer you live in la the smaller your dream house gets when you, <laughs> you when you first move there i'm gonna get a mansion off Mon- mulholland drive and they're like you know okay just a little something in west hollywood and then by the end you're saying like um, a bungalow in encino would be wonderful <laughs> uh, oh, a box in a back alley by yeah. this dumpster oh that's great <laughs> uh, it's 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 and and uh I've seen I, I've seen a lot of people become very successful, and it messes them up. I mean, become world famous, uh, and not everybody, but a, a lot of them. It it's uh, it can it can be a double edged sword. I mean, Bill Murray's sure. quote is, "If you want to be rich and famous, try being rich first and see if that's enough." And I think Jim Carrey's the same way. Um, uh, but uh, I had a, a friend, uh, I have a friend, Melanie Hutzel, who was on SNL for a few years. And I remember when she started, uh, she didn't, she had a hard time trusting new people because uh, she wasn't sure why they wanted to be her friend. They wanted to be her friend because they liked her or because she was on Saturday Night Live. And um, that's why a number of stars, uh, Mike Myers, uh, uh, my friend Jimmy Yato, who is the t- technical director at Saturday Night Live, mm. would always have Jimmy around because he knew he and Jimmy were friends, and Jimmy was a friend uh, of his just for you know, just to be friends. And uh, um, Bruce Willis, high school buddy, is always with him because you know you reach a point where you can't be on the elevator alone with someone for fear of a possible lawsuit. Right. You know? right. Um, so I think you know what, this again is an old, older guy from Austin. <laughs> uh, as you get older, what your, um, what your sense of success is, is peace of mind. Sure. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be a billionaire and have peace of mind. And also it's that, it's that drive that, that gets people, it makes them superstars because it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, one of the best at it was Molly Shannon. Um, and Molly Shannon, I told somebody, somebody asked about her yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. one of the nicest people in Hollywood. So it doesn't, you can still be superstar and, and still be nice. But, uh, um, we all, I think when everybody arrives in Chicago, we're always hoping that we are next, um, uh, the next Mike Myers, the next, uh, sure. Steve Colbert, Steve Carell. Um, I, I and again, there are so many different definitions of success. For some, success might be having had tr- having tried. Right. So I think I think success is living a life where you can live without regret. Okay. Uh, I think, and, and 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 I think during that, how oh, now I'm just. My students sometimes call me the reluctant Buddha because I'll say these things and I'll roll my eyes before I. So here's a reluctant <laughs> Buddha. And I, um, it's uh, now I can't even remember what I was going to say. It was going to change the world. Um, <laughs> oh man, we really needed that too. Yeah, oh, I, I was going into a deep depression. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, uh, I, I think, well, we you do go there for I think for most people, money and fame. Some people are wise enough to, I just want to challenge myself. Sure, I went there for money and fame, and then I made money and then I spent it all. So now I'm just hoping the fame comes around. 
Yeah. Okay. So that's a good the, way op- to- the opposite of Bill Murray's <laughs> advice. Okay, good. <laughs> it's, that's a good way to look. That's a good way to look at it, though. You know, I mean, that's you know, s- success is subjective. Right. You know, it varies uh-huh. from person to person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so move, moving on from, moving on from, from that point, I, I did want to, I did want to get into the, the actual SNL platform itself. Um, you know, we have, when we look, so it, it sounds like from what you're saying, just to kind of, um, give quick cliff notes on it is that the people that actually became successful that you worked with at second city and that you've met over the years, these were the people that actually were just trying to hone their craft and they loved truly loved what they did Mm. and they just were free about it all the time no care in the world they weren't trying too hard they weren't trying to please the masses they were just being themselves and those are the people that were the most successful um i I also think they did have a certain amount of business acumen to mm. you know what what uh what they did best and how they can how they can serve the audience right um, and it, so it sounds like a lot of the people that came in with, oh, I have the aspirations to be on SNL and I want to be, you know, I want to be the next, you know, Belushi or mm. the next Farrell or Adam Sandler or, or Sandler yeah, or Tina Fey or whoever. Yeah. Um, huh? those people actually were the ones that they kind of, they kind of stopped short. You know, they, I mean, the buck stopped pretty quick because they put too much expectations on themselves and maybe they stressed themselves out too much over the years maybe they tried too hard and it came across as you said forced Mm -hmm. earlier Um, i think that sounds fair yeah yeah um so for those so so let's take it to the next level for those that made it on to snl had us you know even if because we've seen over the years we saw people like i mean dana carvey and i mean if you go back and watch his early years from the mid to late 80s he was actually the star of snl he was getting the most airtime he was getting the most um, he was getting the most characters, at least from what I remember, what I remember seeing. Um, and then he came out and kind of, you know, he helped Wayne's world get going. And then we kind of saw him do what, um, like movies like master of disguise and, uh, oh, yeah. um, just like some really horrible films that were based on some just sketches of his that may have been funny for like five, five, six minutes. But when you try to make a 90 minute movie about it, it just turns into a, a film full of fart jokes and, you know, gigs that fall flat on their face. Mm. Um, so, you know, SNL has always been this. We've seen launching pad for God. I mean, hundreds of careers at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I want to open up to the panel here, including, you know, Gary deal and myself as well. What do you guys think makes a successful and failed career post SNL for alumni members? And I want to preface this by saying, um, yeah, the, let's let's remove the subjective label on it's it's everyone's personal opinion. Let's go off the basis of yeah. did you were you able to make a successful career? Maybe even you know you don't have to necessarily carry your own film. Um, but have, but, a, have a continuous film career, right? Exactly, yeah. not okay. just one, two, three films that, yeah. and then you're the just bomb. done after yeah. a couple of years. Okay, yeah. Um, so so yeah, let's let's just jump into that. Um, uh, Neil, let's start with you since um, we've been kind of. Uh, since we, you had kind of jumped in on this last, um, what do you think? What 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 actors or comedians have you seen that have become successful and failures after the SNL careers? I mean, um, personally, like uh, one of my favorites is Dan Aykroyd. Uh, he did, I think, very well after after his time on SNL because he did Coneheads, which came out of SNL as a skit. You know, he did things like Blues Brothers that he helped write. Right. Um, but he has been a steady face in film since he left SNL, not necessarily the star in every movie, you know, obviously he had Ghostbusters, things like that, but even minor characters, he just had a successful career uh, right. after leaving. An Academy he, Award nomination for Driving Miss Daisy. Yes, yes. that's right. Yeah. That, that's so, it's, it's so smart of, of actors that do that. That, that, and that's that business savvy you were talking about, Tom, I think is they, they realize here's my time at the top. I've got maybe five to 10, maybe even 15 years as, uh, I can, you know, I can carry a movie by myself. My name as a headline will bring droves of people and I have to acclimate at some point. I have to fade into the background just a little bit and find a, uh, you know, a, a particular character I get typecast in, or maybe I have to find an actor that's carrying a lot of these movies and cling on to him. Because if you look that with Dan Aykroyd, he did that with Adam, with Adam Sandler films. Mm-hmm. Uh, once Sandler started to become big in the late nineties, early two thousands. 
Um, so smart, smart of him to do that. You know, a lot of I feel like uh, the the good actors that have those lengthy, decade long mm. careers, they do things like that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that was one of the problems with Dana Carvey. The audience didn't want to watch him be the lead in the movie. Yeah, yeah. I would have to agree. I mean, I, I actually I, I go back to Master of Disguise, but I as a kid. I watched it and I knew how how fucking awful it was. <laughs> like this, I mean, I like even as even as you know it, a nine ten year old when it came out, like I was like this this is just horrible. Yeah, this I mean there's there's some great fart jokes in here, um, but that that's it. It's just it's one it's one fart joke after another, and I love fart jokes mm. even even as an adult. But there's only <laughs> you can't, can't make an hour movie. and a half of that. <laughs> uh, oh man, uh, Gary, what about you? Uh, well, I, I'm gonna go with. Uh, uh, Adam Sandler, uh, because um, Tom, you'd brought up uh, sort of business acumen, um, and from my impression of Adam Sandler, like he he does a sort of Happy Madison productions. Um, he does have his own production company. Yeah, yeah, so that that to me denotes that he's got like I, I think Adam Sandler is very funny um, in a lot of his. Uh, roles that he plays and he can like every you know seven or eight years he'll he'll say you know what i'm actually going to act and try and make a movie like uh uncut gems which was one of the most stressful movies i've ever seen uh but you know he <laughs> they did didn't really allow well you a second to breathe in no. that film <laughs> um and like adam sandler he's he he can do that and, like in I like a lot of his movies that he makes. Like, um, I thought Pixels was really funny. Um, you know, Wedding Singer, uh, and then like he'll also kind of just put out just a bunch of garbage, like Jack and Jill. <laughs> like it's just like just terrible garbage. Grown Ups Two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bedtime so, Stories. <laughs> yeah. And so I think Adam Sandler is a very one of the very interesting people that has come from there because he almost kind of. Uh, by having his own production company can kind of set what kind of movie he wants to do. Right. So is he like, I just want to put out a real crappy movie that makes me some money. Um, or do I want to actually take some time and thought and be in this, you know, uh, a more thought provoking movie like punch drunk love or something yeah. like that. What's crazy about that is, is honestly that if you look at it, he's had one of the most, one of the longest and lengthiest substantial careers because yeah. it's lasted when he he got he he and farley were fired off snl in what 95 uh, I, I right think that's when uh, happy gilmore came out yeah 95. 94 yeah. um so he's had 25 years and still to this day i'm i'm confident enough to say if adam sandler was the one single headliner on a film it doesn't matter what it is he would still be able to carry it to 100 million dollars over yeah. the course of the movie's lifetime mm -hmm. i'd still feel confident in saying that um, it's also very I, loyal to his friends oh, yeah, that, that's, it's that's the same that's six guys in every movie with them it so. is yeah <laughs> Yeah. And, and and I like that because it, it feels to me like one of those old old timey theater troops. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, you know we all kind of act together and work together and support each other. It's kind of like what Tom, what you were talking about with um, uh, you know the the improv group mm -hmm. at Second City. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, so I mean, you you could really put him up there. If I mean, who would you put that comes from that SNL background that would still you know 25, 30 years later they can still hold? I think Will Ferrell yeah. can probably safely I, fall into that. I, I think if Chris um, Farley had lived, he would have definitely been successful like that. I, I, I from, from yeah. you know that I love Chris Farley. Right. You know that Matt Foley, every yeah. one of his motivational speaker <laughs> scenes is my favorite. Yeah. It's my favorite of all time. Uh, it I, always will be. Yeah, and I, I think the Matt Foley scene is the highlight of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> No, I, I really think that's the funniest scene that they've done. Living in a van down by the river is yeah. synonymous. Yeah. I mean, what is that? Sa Samurai Chef was pretty good too. Yeah, just saying. Um, there's a lot of great ones, but I don't. With Farley, I I had always worried with him because he stuck to. If you look at if you look at Tommy Boy, you look at Black Sheep, you look at almost almost heroes. Um, you, I, with those three title roles that he had, as as pretty pretty good as uh, the first two were, you know, Tommy Boy being, in my opinion, just being mm. in a league all its own. He really played the same character over and over again, and he, he really he really focused and kind of clung to that body comedy. And I feel as he got older, that would kind of get away from him. I feel with Farrell and Sandler and guys like Bill Murray, even, um, you know, and even I guess Dan Arca to an extent, but I feel like they were they had more in their portfolio to mm -hmm. pull from as far as characters go. And Tom, you actually got to see him live. So maybe, maybe I've, I've just only seen, 
I've, I've just seen his scenes and his films and maybe there were other characters he had worked on over the course of his earlier years that he just never tapped into really or that I just haven't seen so I could oh. be wrong well, that was kind of Chris all the time. He was uh, okay. one of the nicest guys in the world. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. So nice. Yeah, and also, he could vomit on cue. What? Uh, Are he you kidding? Vomit, he could vomit on cue. What would what, 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 he do? I like, did he have some, like, I, was there, yeah. did he do anything yeah. beforehand? Like, would he punch himself in the stomach or? He kind of opened a trash can and vomit. He could vomit on cue. And was a man, was a man of many talents. <laughs> he was yeah. a man. He's a renaissance man, yeah. really. Yeah. The, the reason I say that, you know, Chris Farley's career would have persisted is because right. I, uh, I, whenever I see him in anything, I think that um, there's a, a, a pure, there was a purity to him and a, a kindness that I think shone Very through true. Um, in any of the roles he was in, like uh, the Chippendales dancer guy um, with uh, the skit from <laughs> Patrick Swayze. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that that, resonates with the audience and like as you said johnny he he did do a lot of body comedy i think he would have had to adjust that as he got older but i think that that purity would have and kindness would have still made a connection with people okay i think he would have had to do a small role that would be a right turn oh you know, for sure uh, i totally 100 agree or I was, oh that's that was chris farley yeah i didn't recognize him oh chris, chris farley is capote what <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say Al Capone. I was like, dude, I would watch the shit out oh of that my movie. God. Chris Farley is Al Capone. <laughs> That'd be horrible. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree to disagree. And yeah. I, I think, sh was he capable of it? From what I saw, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, like Tom said, if he had that one right role to be able to turn it around, sure. Um, I also you know, want I just, to say that it, it's real easy to fall. It can be, and this it may have happened to him, that, uh, oh, this is what people want. This is what I'll give it. Right. Um, you just kind of become a caricature of your character. Right. So, uh, it, can, it can be, especially when you're you know, uh, uh, warping your perception, as Chris sometimes did. Yeah. So, and I mean, that and it's 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 a it's a it's a shame like that, because, you know, we all we all know he was he was infamous for, you know, his his unfortunate abuse with with partying alcohol and drugs and you know i'm i myself as you know a former alcoholic and addict you know it it's and i mean tom you said you, you did a lot back in your day so i think we can both yeah. even attest this you know it's you you're not fully confident in who you are mm -hmm. sometimes as a person and the image that or the, the persona that you're trying to you know portray to other people so it's nice to get that that relief from your own self. You're not necessarily comfortable in your own skin at times. I, I at least personally, I, I had felt that. Um, and uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I acted for such a long time, you know, is because I was trying to be I was trying to be somebody else. I enjoyed being in the moment and and not having to be me because yeah. just me was boring. Yeah. Well, you, it wasn't you were at least on stage. I don't know about acting, how much so. of that was done. <laughs> Oh wow! Uh, we go. We got ourselves a fucking comedian to my left. All yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yes. I just shots fired. Improv. Oh. Yeah, Gary will not be joining us on the next episode because he'll be six feet under somewhere up north. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, yeah, may, it, from a lot of the documentaries I had watched on Chris Farley, just he has such he has, he's such an interesting life for the short time that we were actually blessed to have him mm -hmm. with us. Um, you know, he he yeah his 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 parents had always said he was always the class clown um always trying to always trying to impress the girls by mm -hmm. you know falling flat in his face and and doing like half-ass push-ups and being like want to go out i can get 10 push-ups in a row and he would do like three and then you know gasp for error and right and yeah <laughs> pretend to be short of breath and stuff um so yeah maybe you're right maybe, maybe he would have it would have it would have been nice to see yeah. definitely one of those actors that went way too soon mm -hmm. um for sure uh, so, Tom, what about you? As far as um, who who would you think uh, has had the most successful career post SNL uh, up until this point, for your, your own opinion? Oh, I, I I think it's it's I'd have to agree with Adam Sandler. I think okay. has done a lot of interesting things, and yeah, thank you, Tom. He does a lot of things that just seems like he wants to go out and hang out with with his friends and not really worry about quality. Right. And, uh, I didn't think you'd come to me with this question, so I didn't really prepare oh, no, it's an okay. answer. No, 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 but that, that's 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 perfect because really the the best ones there, like Adam Sandler, is 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 a huge one. Um, and Neil, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm having a brain fart. Who who did you say again? Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd. Thank you. Um, so for me, I I was I was going to go with uh, 
with the obvious of of Will Ferrell because I felt like he oh, had yeah. you know, Bill Will Ferrell or or uh, Bill Murray. But you know, the more and more I think about it, and the more and more that we're talking about it, I I really would say I know that she hasn't had as long of a career, but mm-hmm. Tina Fey at okay. this oh. point. Um, yeah. Now, granted. I might be a little biased. 30 Rock is one of my favorite sitcoms of all time. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually, when I saw Mean Girls the first time, I, I didn't care what my friends in high school said. I was like, I was like, I don't give a shit if it's about a (laughs) a bunch of like clicks in high school with chicks and shit. It's funny as fuck. And you guys need to see it if you haven't. I thought that was Lindsay Lohan. Tina Fey played the math teacher and she wrote the script for it. Oh, okay. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know know if I've seen Mean Girls actually. (laughs) Really? Yeah. You'd, you'd like it, man. It's funny. Um, I mean, Lindsay Lohan was in it, but uh, it was Tina Fey and um, and Amy Poehler's. Mm. Well, it might have just been Tina Fey. I'd have to go back and look. Um, but for her, and I know she just... And so you said she was... Tom, you had said you had seen her at Second City in the late 80s. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, early okay. 90s. Yeah. She's okay. was always wonderful. And, and yeah. uh, she was very... I, I recently uh, listened to the book Improv Nation, and uh, there were some quotes from... And oh, she was... Okay. She was very happy just to stay working at Second City. She was very grateful for that job, and she yeah. loved it. How how long was she there? Because I, from what I've seen, her career actually didn't get started until, like, she didn't get on SNL until the late 90s, early 2000s. Is that correct? Uh, I, yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, she was probably on main stage, I want to say, 92, 93. Uh-huh. Um, she was in a great show wow. at it's called Pinata Full of Bees. Rachel Dretch was in the uh-huh. in the cast. Scott Atsit, who was also on mm-hmm. Thirty Rock. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll see, I think Kevin Dorf might have been in the cast. Jim Zulovic, who passed uh-huh. away. Uh, yeah, because yeah. it seems like she had a longer stage career than than a majority of the uh, her <laughs> other counterparts. Yeah, that she she stayed out there for longer. Um, I think she did a few shows at uh, S- uh, Second City. Okay. So with her, with her, I guess the reason that I, that I pick her is number one outside of, she doesn't need Amy Poehler at this point in her career, really for the last 10 years, I don't feel she has to pull a movie by herself. Um, I do think they are, they are better together. They are hilarious together. Um, but she has done something which I find to be very unique in the fact that she is writing the majority of, she writes the majority of the scripts and the movies and the TV series and the specials that she's a part of. So I think to keep your name to keep your name relevant if you don't necessarily think you can just do it with one form is to Mm. be multifaceted and be good in multiple forms. Yeah. Be a director to, you know, like, I mean, outside of the comedy circuit, you know, I mean, Tarantino does that, Mm. you know, Tarantino has not just directed and made eight films. He's also written an additional 30, Yeah, you know, and um, and it helps her, uh, you know, control her brand by, by writing it. So she gets a lot more input in that. And, um, I think Johnny and I can attest after spending the last two days writing it, it it's tough to do. It like, is. It's, it's hard to write. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess some people are more naturally inclined to it, but, um, well, to just stay, to just stay focused for mm-hmm. that length of time yeah. and to not necessarily even know if what you're writing is, is gold or not. It might be funny to you, but you know, if to a room of 50 mm-hmm. people or even 20, it might only hit with 30% of them. Yeah. You know, and, you never know. And just, just staring at that blank page when you first start, is is an intimidating thing so uh you know i i think uh um she definitely uh by being you know a writer um is able to express her voice a lot more in the works that she does yeah absolutely uh want to switch wanted to switch course really quick and i i do want to t- i do want to touch on failures um uh, and when i say failures please please let's let's preface this by saying these these it's not that these people are these are they're losers or they they couldn't cut it and it doesn't mean that they didn't have any type of success in their career. It's like how we mentioned with Dana Carvey earlier. They were on SNL and made it big, and they were primed to be the next Belushi. Or, um, let's, or call it, let's call it didn't you know. go as planned. Yeah, didn't go as planned. There you didn't go. go yeah. yeah. Um, so who would we jump with that? Uh, Neil, let's just start again with you. I mean, obviously, just the fact that they made it on SNL is a huge accomplishment. You it know, is. you can't you can't knock anybody for for you know, maybe not continuing the career after that. But I felt like someone who I always thought was really funny, but I don't think carried it very well after uh, SNL was Norm MacDonald. Um, yeah. I always thought he was pretty funny. Um, but then, you know, he goes and does dirty work, which was kind of okay. But then he just kind of fades away to me. I right. I just don't think he kept up with it. I think Norm, from what I hear, never met him, uh, mm-hmm. has had a lot of personal issues. Uh-huh. I think he loves to gamble. 
Okay. And, and I think he will tell you that he loves to gamble. <laughs> At yeah. least he doesn't hide it. I mean, that's, oh. that's, the, <laughs> that's respect. We got respect for me. And also from respect. what I've heard on, like I've heard him on a podcast, I think he's not very good at gambling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's right. He just sucks. At it. <laughs> and he admits to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Gary, what about you? Um, you know, uh, I think Dana Carvey's a really good one, but, um, uh, you know, David Spade was also on, uh, SNL, right? Yeah. yeah with Chris and, Rock and yeah. Sandler. Chris and it, it, it's hard to say that his career was a failure cause he, he did have, you know, Spin City and a lot of successful movies. Uh, just shoot me. Just shoot Spin me. Spin City yeah. was Michael oh, J. Fox. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh but, and rules of uh, engagement. Yes, That's right. Yes, thank, th Warburton. thank you. Um, but I, I haven't seen him do much lately. And uh, as Tom said, that may have just been about shifting focus on what he wants. Like he sure. might be focusing on, you know, family life a lot more now than he is on building a career because he's already done that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would think with David Spade. Yeah, he he didn't. He seemed prime because that that group, in my opinion, was at least if not the funniest overall cast mm -hmm. between in the, in the early 90s but one of the two at least i yeah. mean between outside of the headliners with with rock fair um farley and sandler yeah you had spade you had rob schneider you had tim meadows yeah um a lot of good supporting cast yeah and and tim meadows was another one that i was always disappointed that he was just he was just a supporting man um yeah i, I don't know i mean spade he had he had his own tv series he yeah. also had joe dirt yeah um and he's been in guess he's been in a lot of stuff that that yeah that's that's a good one yeah that, that's, 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 he dates models he what yeah. he dates yeah. models yeah. that's true yeah. <laughs> if that's not the epitome of success i don't know what yeah. it is no. and, and when, so, you're, when you're david spade if you're dating models that yes yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> yeah. The guys you're are, the, the guys are, weird looking guy <laughs> the guy i mean the, yeah the guy's a hobbit i mean yeah. you know just without the hairy feet <laughs> and, and, and i mean he's like our a winner yeah, <laughs> he's he's our winner of people that didn't go quite according to plan. Yeah, <laughs> like because like he had many many successes, but like it hasn't like sustained. Sure, you know, um, which I don't know if that's something that he chose to to change his desire on, right. or if he's not just able to get those kind of roles anymore. So right. that that's a tough one to say. Yeah, no, he's I, ba I, 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 basically played the same character, and it, he plays it well. True, he um, does. And it could be people just got tired of seeing it. I don't know. I, I think that I think, and that goes back to what we talked about with Chris Farley. I think you're. I think that's that's spot on. Yeah, it is the same character over and over again. And how how often can you do that? It lasts for mm. maybe five years, maybe maybe ten. You know, but eventually it just kind of makes you fade into oblivion. Yeah, or back into the supporting roles at least. Um, Tom, anybody stand out for you in that list? Oh, uh, Up Snyder. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Uh, 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 although I've never met Rob Schneider, <laughs> I hear he's hard to work with. Really? Yes. In fact, I I, um, I was friends with um, Mike Mitchell, who directed Deuce Bigelow. Uh huh. Uh, and second day on the set, uh, Rob Schneider was in his trailer throwing stuff around, mm -hmm. and Mike had to go talk him down and really get him out, of, out of yeah get him on the set, and I. I was, I just caught the conversation went something like, dude, Rob Schneider, I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Damn straight. What do you think? What do you think you're a Bill Murray? <laughs> Come on. Yeah, at the next Chevy Chase. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Jesus. That, that's interesting because I would have thought Rob Schneider would have uh, been more difficult to work with in terms of like him being like sort of ADHD, like all over yeah. the place and Go having, too goofy on yeah, set and ha having to focus him. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. It's funny. If you look at it though, if you look at a lot of Adam Sandler's films, Rob oh. Schneider was initially in, uh, he's probably in the majority of his fir for his first 10 years. Mm -hmm. And over the last 15, yeah, I mean, I, I was watching, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry a couple nights ago. It was just on Netflix. And uh, he that was the first one I had seen him in, even as just a small supporting role in the last 15 years. So I wonder if something maybe happened between the two of them that they, they kind of had a bit of a falling out. Or maybe he was so difficult, the director, Sandler, worked with like Adam, uh, not Adam McKay, that's Will Ferrell. Um, I can't remember the, the guy that normally directs his movies. Um, but maybe he was kind of yeah. like, hey, look, you know, obviously you're the big headliner here, but 
don't bring Rob back. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to deal with his, his, his temper tantrums, you know? Uh, maybe that's what happened. Hmm. I don't know, um, but Rob Schneider was in Down Periscope, which is one of the most yes. underrated films of all time. <laughs> that's the Tom Arnold one, isn't it? No, it's, uh, Kelsey, Kelsey Grammer. Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> Kelsey yeah. Grammer. Yeah. What's, uh, I'm thinking of... Um, Mikhail's uh, Navy. Mikhail's Navy. Navy, thank yeah. you. Mikhail's Navy. Navy. <laughs> I miss Tom Arnold. Who, who, who <laughs> under, underrates Down Periscope? That's my question, Neil. Nobody. I mean, it's, it's, almost, a, it's almost as bad of a movie as Spider-Man 2. No, no, those are both excellent <laughs> movies. Tom, uh, Tom, just so you know, Gary's two favorite movies are Casablanca and Spider-Man 2. That is correct. And uh, he said he'll go to his grave with, uh, with thinking Spider-Man 2 is one of the top two best films of all time so i don't remember saying that but i might have <laughs> <laughs> it's mine now i'm using it's, that <laughs> it's mine <laughs> right? i mean i did say that of course oh, oh, oh yes <laughs> of course um i think i think for me um it it, it is because uh, you guys have named some really good ones um and dana carvey was a pretty obvious one but i think it is it is sad to see um you know when you see people like you know tim meadows or horatio sands um, All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, even even people like you know Kevin Nealon, mm-hmm. or, or to go back a long time like Jane Curtin from the seventies. Or Jane Curtin, yeah, yeah. Outside, because what did she do outside of Conehead? Uh, well, she, she was also she was also on uh, Third Rock from the Sun with uh, John Lithgow, yeah. and yeah. she, she was, was, she was Kate great. Nally. Kate Nally. She was on a TV show for a long time. Uh, okay, a, a sitcom. Yeah, 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 th- yeah. Third Rock from the Sun. Yeah, well, yeah. That, also. Well, sure. yeah. Another, uh, another, but it was an earlier sitcom called Kate Nally. I was thinking it was like the early '80s. Oh, okay. Oh, I hadn't even heard of that uh, yeah, one. I've never heard of that one. Again, um, I'm, I'm older than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so yeah, you see people like that, you know, and the and the people that we always that we love that had successful supporting role careers, you know, uh, John Lovitz is probably yeah. my favorite guest star mm-hmm. on a sitcom because he's been on so many yeah. that i've just <laughs> he, he he also voiced a coffee with john lovitz yeah i would love to i think a cup of coffee with john lovitz by the end of the night would turn into some you're in some brothel in singapore i think a cup of coffee with john lovitz should be a podcast so john lovitz if you're listening you can go ahead and make Dude, podcast. I, will. I mean yeah yeah tom you gotta know somebody that knows john lovitz yeah you can hook us up <laughs> I, no, uh, I, I can let me make a call okay that's fine. <laughs> right now let's get let's get him on speaker um so yeah you you have all of those those smaller actors that you might be able to say oh they were big on snl and people thought they were going to do great things after they were done mm-hmm. but they didn't quite meet those expectations um you know what i i, I am I'm, I'm probably gonna get a lot of pushback from you guys but I'm going to say Eddie Murphy, and I'm going to tell you why. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give You are her... going to get a lot of pushback, okay, so go ahead and tell I us why. Now, I, I want to preface this by saying I fucking love Eddie Murphy, and okay. he's easily, easily one of my favorite comedians to come out of SNL, for sure. Um, outside, though, think about that. Outside of Beverly Hills Cop, outside of the Dr. Doolittle series, outside of... Uh, what's another? What's another? Shrek. Yeah, outside of Shrek. Um, and even that same goes kind of for Mike Myers, you know? Mm-hmm. Outside of those... You know, those first, I guess for Myers, it was, you know, 10, 15 years. For Eddie Murphy, it was about 20, I guess. It was a pretty lengthy career. I haven't seen him in anything in the last 20 years outside of, he had a really good, he had that Oscar-nominated role for Dreamgirls. Right. Um, and he's, you, you, you saw him in, like, The Adventures of Pluto Nash, which absolutely bombed. Yeah. I mean, nobody's um, career can survive that movie. I, mean. <laughs> I guess not. But I, at one time, I would put, Eddie Murphy on this upper echelon of what we were talking about with the Will Ferrells, the Adam Sandlers, the Bill Murrays, uh, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really, it was really sad to me to see his career drop off once the two thousands came around and just where has he gone? You know, maybe, and maybe he has stopped for personal reasons, but I've, I mean, I've looked up articles on what happened to you. Yeah, there's all those, all those articles on Buzzfeed yeah. and stuff like that. Like what happened to so-and-so what happened to the cast of Full the top House 10 or, things you didn't know about Eddie Murphy. Or Murray, yeah. And what happened was it, was it, but I didn't see anything about personal reasons. Um, it just says he's been working in a lot of like indie films and he's been writing a lot more. So I just, I feel like his, I feel like there was still, more for his career and i also think he's one of those comedic actors who did a pretty decent job at transitioning into drama Mm -hmm. um and i would have liked to see more from his career i think overall he's more talented than adam sandler i think he's probably more talented will ferrell i just i'm disappointed at his career stopping short and i don't i guess since we changed it from failures post snl to 
didn't see them going there. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't see him stopping after the early 2000s and just not hearing anything about him really because i haven't even really seen him in supporting roles i haven't seen him in yeah. tv shows and i could be wrong maybe there's just there's something out there that just i'm not you know i'm yeah. privy to that info but he would he would be mine so i mean you know i mean i mean like he, I, I, I might be wrong but i feel like i heard that he's trying to do a coming to america too right and, yeah oh, wow. i think i did hear that that's yeah. fantastic i love you know him, to see him in arsenio hall again would be fantastic would be but, wonderful you, you you know me like I'm I'm not a big fan of like the Hollywood remakes 30 years later or putting sequels onto a movie that don't need it as funny as the first one was I, I just I don't think that's that's not enough for me I don't know maybe I'm maybe yeah. I'm just selfish maybe I wanted more from yeah. from my Eddie fair, fair enough I, I mean I, I would <laughs> say that he had a very successful career for sure I mean, 20 absolutely. 25 years um, absolutely. and yeah. then you know that may have just been the length of time he wanted to work. I, I, Maybe. I, I don't know. It, it just seems like he had a long career that had a lot of big movies. In oh, it. he was an A-lister. Yeah, absolutely. For fucking yeah. sure. Absolutely. There's no argument. I think the second thing he was ever in was Trading, uh, trading Places. Trading Places. Yeah. That's right. With, with Dan, Dan Aykroyd. Aykroyd. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you come out strong with something like that. And you do. Yeah. Roll Where right do you into go? Beverly Hills That's right. I mean, uh, people didn't do, think that, do, you know, do, do, Peter do, Jackson do, do, would be able to top uh, Evil Dead. Or not Evil Dead. Um... Uh, brain dead but yeah he topped it with lord of the rings yep. for those of you that don't know brain dead is peter jackson had a first like 10 15 years of his career when he lived in new zealand mm. and just did straight up torture porn gore fest zombie films for like 10 years and they were all horrible i love Anyways, dead alive i loved dead, dead alive that's what i was thinking of dead alive, dead alive. Uh, yeah they killed um, all the zombies with the lawnmower yeah yeah oh my god such such an iconic scene so great <laughs> um yeah, so 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 yeah, so I'd say I'd say that'd be mine there. Um, so yeah, guys, unfortunately, we have run out of time for this week's episode. We once again uh, want to thank Tom Booker for joining us. Uh, Tom, thank you for uh, having we, me. Yeah, it was a privilege having you. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to have you back again. Uh, would be great sooner sooner rather than later. Um, I'd say this is definitely one of our more interesting episodes, yes. especially over the last couple months. Um, so thank you for coming on and, and sharing your knowledge with us and and your uh, your wonderful humor. Well, thank um, you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. And thanks for giving me something to do during the quarantine. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> anytime, anytime. Uh, so for, yeah, for Johnny. And Gary. And Neil. And all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick. Stay classy. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>